Ken Cuccinelli is the acting director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. He's been on the job since uh, June 10th, so he's been there, been here for less than a month, but it's probably one of the busiest jobs around there. You are the acting director. What's going to make you the permanent director? <laughs> well, to be the permanent director in this position, the president would have to submit me for confirmation to the Senate, would have to go through the Senate, obviously be, get a favorable vote. So is, this, is he watching this? Is this part of the interview? I don't know. You know, you never know what the president may be watching. Right. But, but uh, when we leave here, we'll all know because we'll see it on Twitter. You'll let us know if you're watching MSNBC. <laughs> yes, that's exactly uh, let's right. Let's talk about the asylum process. You have uh, said that there, uh, the, the Congress needs to end incentives and loopholes in our current system. Are you talking about immigration or asylum or both? And what specifically does Congress need to end? You're suggesting there's an incentive uh, other than the economic ones that we've just discussed for people to try and get into the country in a way yeah, that you don't think that, makes sense. That's a well-asked question. So there are economic incentives. We're dealing with some of those in uh, turning our attention to public charge rule, as it's called, which is really essentially trying to keep uh, sponsors to, of aliens coming in responsible when they go on welfare and start to um, draw down benefits from the taxpayers. Uh, that's one item that you see advancing, both based on the president's memo in May, and there is a large regulation going through the process, which hopefully will be done sometime in the mm -hmm. summer or fall. Uh, that addresses some of those. But on the asylum side, we have uh, uh, an arrangement with credible fear, mm -hmm. with this initial low standard, not the final one, not the final actual fear right. standard, but the initial one that is keeping people in a pipeline where they're not going to succeed on the other right. end. That really we need Congress to fix that. That is the ideal way to, to approach any of these challenges. That is a big so what, what, feature. So what does success look like for you? That the standard when you present yourself is higher? In other words, more people get turned away at the front end because a lot of people get turned away in the second stage. As yes. we, you and I have discussed, it is under 10% from the Northern Triangle countries. Right. So I think we can argue that system for a lot of people works, right? 10%, fewer yeah, than 10% of the people apply for asylum. Ultimately. ultimately. So the you're problem saying is that the, from here to there. something has to be changed so that the front end, and that's the email that you, you had sent to your employees to say, uh, we want you to be tougher at the front end so people are not getting into the pipeline who are going to be booted out at the at the back end. Is that is that the argument that you're making? So uh, the standard is the standard. So I wouldn't characterize what I said as being tougher. Okay. I was a new, I'm, an, I'm still new in my role right. in communicating with my employees. So I, I expect them the to... The language you used to, is to uphold our nation's laws by only making positive, credible fear determinations in cases that have a significant probability, right. po probability of success. Right. That's right. And, and what Congress can help us with is to find what amounts to a more accurate first filter. Anybody who's got credible fear, we don't want to screen out of the process. Mm -hmm. But we do want to screen out Those the good. ones that really are never going to make the case before a judge and are not in a position to do that. Because that batch of people, let's just pick a number. Let's say the number goes from 77% to 50%, mm -hmm. and yet the final number stays around 10. Right. Then that 25% of people are no longer clogging a years-long pipeline. And mind you, we have a 325,000 case asylum backlog, mm -hmm. backlog that we are attacking while keeping it from rising. And we've kept it flat, yep. even with the crisis at the southern border, we've kept that backlog from growing. And now we, we're also trying to, we're burning the candle at both ends, mm -hmm. to try to reduce that backlog while continuing to support our partners at the border and processing fairly all the migrants who are coming to the border. One of the things that, you know, you come from Virginia where immigration has been a remarkable boon to Virginia. It is, uh, it, it's economically beneficial. I think you can find any state in the country yes. where it's been. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's look at border apprehensions, because that's where most of our attention is focused these days. Over the last year, there's been a surge. We know in May right. uh, the numbers are, are quite remarkable. This, this does tem tend to correspond to some of the policy changes that we've seen. However, when you look at May, that was 132,000 people, 132,887. There are more than 700,000 people uh, overstaying their visas. And, and by the way, yes. visa overstays tend to be a much bigger problem than Historically, this was, this is 2017. Right. 700,000 people overstayed their visas. What if we just solved that problem? Uh, well, if you solve that problem historically, it's numerically larger than people coming across the border. Right. Now, the, the numbers we're seeing now come across the border um, are 
historic in the last decade at least. And the May numbers, what's so notable about them is about 72 percent of those people were not adult males, single adult males. Mm -hmm. They were families or unaccompanied children. Right. And that is a phenomenally complicating factor. It was obviously, uh, it's, it's, it's easy enough to but, take but care of adults relative to children. But the number still by the number of people on visa overstays. Uh, yes, but the, we're, we don't get a mad rush at any of our facilities on visa overstays. Well, you get no rush, because nobody ever tells you that they're overstaying their visa. Nobody they, ever goes to If they to were to tell us, that's right. That would be a problem. You'd, you'd send them out. That's right, we'd so put them in removal. Wouldn't, if, if one is worried just about immigration policy in general, and if we had more time, we would talk about immigration policy for H-1B engineers who we bring in. Sure. But if one were worried about that, why is the attention that we're spending on the border, it, it feels weird, right? It feels like we're really, really preoccupied with brown people coming in on the southern border. Because really, if you said, what's the hierarchy of things you need to solve in the United States when it comes to immigration, it would be your visa overstay program. Uh, that is still not what's swamping the Border Patrol. It's not what's swamping ICE. ICE is now... Oh, I agree. Well, Border let me control, finish. But that's let not, me finish. Yeah. ICE has been taken out of the business of pursuing visa overstays. Of course, I don't mean that completely, but because of what they're contending with and mm -hmm. backing up CBP down on the border, they're the second stage of that pipeline of detention. And the idea for Border Patrol in their design was not to have detention. It was to catch, process, and return adult Mexican males. Now they're detaining, including children, and they can't move them onto ICE because ICE facilities mm -hmm. are overbooked. And so those folks are swamped with this same border problem and are not available in the same uh, numbers to go pursue visa overstays. You are not wrong about the raw numbers historically mm -hmm. of visa overstays relative to coming across the border illegally. Um, I would say that for visa overstays, all of those people had at least one vetting whatever it may have been, sort to of. get an initial visa. Sort of. I mean, well, not really, right? They got a passport. If you're a Canadian and you come into the United you, well, States, Canadians picked, are the you, biggest problem. You've picked, They're the you've biggest picked offenders. the biggest exception. And uh, that's true. So no Canadian gets vetting also, to come into the United States. For instance, I was in El Paso, and there is a lot of... There's two communities on both sides of that border. They spend time together. Those communities right. are related. They go back and forth. A, a huge chunk of the daily traffic is simply day traffic between the communities because they are together one bigger community. Yeah. We have the same thing on the Canadian border. You have a lot of back and forth. And we do have um, agreements in place with the Canadians. But you're also right. They are, for instance, in our intercorporate Mm -hmm. uh, visas. Yeah. They're a big feature of what we're working on there as we attack uh, some of the failures of that of that program, one of the many visas that uh, has overstay problems. Come in. Hey, MSNBC fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down there and click on any of the videos here to watch the latest interviews and highlights. You can get more MSNBC for free every day with our newsletters. Just visit msnbc.com newsletters to sign up now.